All right, so it's a little late in the day to be doing this. It's about 4.30. Um, this morning I went online and I talked about losing my job. And I was, I still am scared, but I'm trying to swallow the, the, the sheer fear, the sheer terror. Um, I listened to uh, Louise Hay all last night and other, uh, you know, positive meditative thinkers. And um, it helped to kind of calm me down a little bit, at least for the weekend take a breather from being terrified. Um, yeah, I lost my job. I really didn't like it. Um, I never I never actually fit in. Um, I have a hard time fitting in different places, and this was definitely one for a very big reason. And it's kind of okay. Uh, I think I'm going to share something. This is really awful. And this is probably something I shouldn't, shouldn't share at all. But, uh, um, okay, as usual, I will. Uh, I'm not saying this for sympathy, it's just something that I did. I really shouldn't share this. I really shouldn't share this. I, uh, I had a space a few years ago, and things weren't, not a painting space, it was for something else, and things were not going well. It was another situation where I was banging my head against the wall, and everything that could go wrong went wrong. And I really just tried and tried and tried as much as I could. And I knew I had reached the end, but I didn't want to give up. And, uh, okay, this is a part I shouldn't share at all. Uh, trying to figure out how to say this. I got, I got very, very depressed, and I made a decision. And as I was about, okay, I'll put it this way, as I was about to act on the decision, just as I was going to act on the decision, my landlord walked in and he said, he pulled up a stool and he said, Becky, we need to talk. And I said, okay, all right, Henry. And he said, sometimes you got to know when to throw in the towel. He said, you, it's time to stop. And he gave me permission to stop banging my head against the wall, which is something I needed. I had been at this one particular project for seven years and really gave it my my all. And I had planned on it for a long time and, and I went to school for it. And I just, it's what I wanted or what I thought I wanted, kind of wanted, I really did want. And I worked very, very hard and things just kept falling apart. So I made my decision and I went to act on it. And Henry walked in and said, it's time to stop. It still hurts and it's still scary and I'm still sad that I spent seven years of my, my life and my son's life on this one particular project and it, and it didn't pan out. Actually, in total, it would have been ten years. But that's, that's the way it goes. And so yesterday... Uh, you know, when I was let go from my job, I, w I was terrified, and I came home absolutely terrified, and just terror, sheer terror pulsing through my body, and uh, I sat down with my landlady, um, had a couple glasses of wine, and smoked a number of her cigarettes, which I haven't done in a year, in a while anyway. And uh, we talked, and she's like, maybe the universe is trying to tell you it's time to stop um, working these other little jobs and, and really put yourself into your artwork. And I'm like, I, I know, I know, but there's practical. Because a few years ago, I actually almost ended up homeless, and I you know, couldn't afford food because I had thrown everything into, um, into my artwork and getting where I wanted to be. And I had signed this great contract, or what I thought was a great contract, and it was, that fell apart. So, that's the terror that lies within my heart. But I listened to Louise Hay all last night, and, you know, I hate magical thinking. Like, let fear go and breathe joy. I really hate it, because usually it's, people who have a big support system or a fair enough support system that can think that way and they throw caution to the wind and, and if everything goes wrong they still have a place to live and they still have food to eat and their, you know, their pets aren't, lives aren't in jeopardy 
you know, when you're talking to a single woman and you say, you know, throw caution to the wind, it's like, right now we go, are you, are you out of your mind? But that's where we are right now. So, um, after this morning's little video where I kind of laid it all out there and said, if you like what I'm doing, please share. A um, number of people have, and I really appreciate it. But, um, yeah, just if you can, if you like the videos and you like my artwork, please share. Please let people know that I'm here. And uh, this is one of the galleries that I work with, Blue Egg Gallery. The owner's name is Jay Louise, and he's down, he's down in Miami. He just held an event last night, an art event last night. He does it once a month. He's in a really great location in the Antiques and Design Mall on Biscayne Avenue in Miami. So if you've seen anything that you like, you can contact Jay, you can contact me, and we can help you out with pricing and a payment plan if it's needed. If you, if you like things that you've seen on my website or, you know, here. So anyway, there's my spiel. And I went on, uh, you know, I went on this morning and said, oh, it was my job, and scared and terrified. And then I just got to work. And so I've been working all day. And one of, one of the things was, we may have a place to hang this, actually. I did this set of paintings. Okay, I've got too much crap over up here, so I can't hang up both panels right now. But it's a two-panel painting, um, both women wearing, you know, ties and jackets. And there's this kind of, this is going to sound odd, but there's an upscale tailor downtown. He's right across the street. He and his son are big fans of my work. And Hank has offered to hang some of my work, if you'd like, because he has, an, he has a really nice clientele. So I'm getting this ready to maybe hang in Hank's shop, if not to just to sell you know, maybe get it to Miami. But, so we started on the sides. And I decided to put up rainbow colors. It's not something I normally do, but um, I thought it went well with the theme, the two women in the ties and the da-da-da. And plus it's wicked cheery. But, um, yeah, there we are. So I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna put on fresh air on NPR now. Um, today's interview is with Anthony Bourdain, who I just love. And uh, so I'm going to listen to Anthony Bourdain and paint, uh, glaze, glaze the sides of the, the paintings, the edges of the painting, the profile. I'm also going to turn on the AC because I'm very warm and then possibly work on uh, Lauren Mitchell. Ooh, and by the way, Lauren Mitchell, the woman I've been painting, has, um, is apparently on a list to be nominated for a Grammy this year. Sarasota Blues blues and soul singer Lauren Mitchell, uh, a woman who's allowed me to paint her, is on a list to be nominated for a Grammy. 20 feet from stardom. Always 20 feet from stardom. But anyway, let's listen to Anthony Bourdain and get some work done. Okay, that's my landlady. Um, so Anthony Bourdain on, on NPR's Fresh Air. And get to work. This is Fresh Air. I'm Dave Davies, and for Terry Gross. Our guest, Anthony Bourdain, takes TV audiences to places all over the world, exploring local cultures and cuisine, and offering his own unique commentary on what we see. His series, Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, is now in its 10th season on CNN. Bourdain also has a new documentary called Wasted, about how much food we waste and what we can do about it. Before he discovered his gift for writing and storytelling, Bourdain spent decades in the restaurant business, becoming the chef in what he describes as a working-class brasserie in New York. Then he wrote a best-selling book, Kitchen Confidential, and several others, and began producing and starring in TV shows about food and the places he loves and visits. He has a habit of saying exactly what he thinks, which has led to some public battles with others in the food world over the years. I spoke to Anthony Bourdain last fall when he published a new cookbook called Appetites. Well, Anthony Bourdain, welcome to Fresh Air. I'd like to begin with the reading from the book. Share this with us. What is it that normal people do? What makes a normal, happy family? How do they behave? What do they eat at home? How do they live their lives? I had little clue how to answer these questions for most of my working life as I've been living it on the margins. I didn't know any normal people. From age 17 on, normal people had been my customers. They were abstractions, literally shadowy silhouettes in the dining room of wherever it was I was working at the time. 
I looked at them through the perspective of the lifelong professional cook and chef, which is to say, as someone who did not have a family life, who knew and associated only with fellow restaurant professionals, who worked while normal people played, and who played while normal people slept. To the extent that I knew or understood normal people's behaviors, it was to anticipate their immediate desires. Would they be ordering the chicken or the salmon? I usually saw them only at their worst, hungry, drunk, horny, ill-tempered, celebrating good fortune, or taking out the bad on their servers. What they did at home, what it might be like to wake up late on a Sunday morning, make pancakes for a child, watch cartoons, throw a ball around a backyard. These were things I only knew from movies. Thanks. And that's one of the reasons you wrote a cookbook about normal food and normal everyday stuff. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. You seem like you had a normal life. You grew up in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Your parents sounded like normal people. Why didn't you get along with normal people? Uh, I don't know. I was an angry kid. You know, as a child of uh, the Kennedy years, the summer of love, I missed. I, I wasn't old enough for the for everything that was happening with the, with the subculture. So when I became an adolescent, I was disappointed, very disappointed, bitterly disappointed with the way the country was going. I seemed to have missed the good times. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, I was definitely a very angry, bitter, nihilistic, destructive and self-destructive uh, kid. You did acid when you were 13, is this true? Yeah, uh, like, a, like most 13-year-olds, I think, 13-year-old boys in particular. You know, I was awkward, I lacked confidence, I was looking for some kind of a template for a personality, and... Um, I guess like a lot of people at the time, I, I, I found that in drugs. I defined myself uh, by the drugs I was taking and identified with the people who were doing LSD and marijuana and other drugs. Those are the people I wanted to hang out with. You found a home in among restaurant people, right? You went, dropped out of college, went to culinary school. Yeah, well, I started working as a dishwasher one summer, and it was really a big event for me because up to that point, I was lazy. This was the first discipline the first organization, because it is a very militaristic organization, the Kitchen Brigade, the first people whose respect I wanted, and the first time in my life that uh, that I went home feeling respect for myself. I mean, I'd work, it was very hard work. You had to be there on time. There were certain absolute rules. And for whatever reason, I responded to that. It was a mix of chaos, but also considerable order that I guess I needed at the time. It's interesting that you describe the discipline because a lot of what people think of when they think of restaurant people is a really wild, hedonistic lifestyle, the hour-after-hour hour stuff that goes on forever. Look, it, it, at its root, it is factory work in the sense that uh, the, the, the religion of any successful or, or busy restaurant is consistency. You have to do the same dish the same way and on time. I was a happy dishwasher. I jokingly say that I learned every important lesson uh, uh, all the most important lessons of my life as a dishwasher, and in some ways that's true. But but it is a very organized thing. I mean, no one lasts in the restaurant business who does not present their part of an order, which requires many people uh, on time. You, it's a it's a it's not a team sport, but it's a team activity. And if you let the team down, everybody crashes. Your big breakthrough came with the book Kitchen Confidential, huge bestseller. Started with an article you wrote. Tell us that story. Well, I, I wrote a, a piece intending it for a free paper called the New York Press that they give out a little boxes on the corner, and I, you know they offered me a hundred dollars. Uh, you know I figured their standards were low enough that, that that they would take it, and my my intention was to entertain a few other people in the restaurant business in the New York area. I thought that would be really cool. I I, I was a fan of George Orwell's Down and Out in Paris and London, and and that account of a of, of another dishwasher's life had thrilled me, and I kind of wanted to evoke that response in a few other cooks. And, and uh, for people who don't know, yeah, what's the kind of the, the substance of the of the story you were writing about? Oh, uh, I just wanted to write about my life from the point of view of uh, a working uh, journeyman chef of no particular distinction, uh, honestly. Maybe uh, I, I, I didn't mind goosing the general public, uh, horrifying them a little, but that was not the intention. I wanted to just write about our thing, our life, the way we spoke in the same sort of over-testosterone, uh, high-speed, hyperbolic prose that uh, uh, that I was familiar with in the kitchens. Uh, but the customer, the intended reader, was always a fellow professional who would get it, and I, I hope they would get it and respond. 
So I wrote the piece. They said they'd take it. They kept bumping it every week. I'd run to the box on the corner and <laughs> open the magazine, open the paper, and I, I wasn't in that issue. And uh, eventually, at a moment of frustration, I think my mom said to me, "Well, you should send it to the New Yorker. I, I you know, I, I'll, I'll, I know someone there. They'll read it." And I thought, "Okay, great. You know, of course, the New Yorker. The, 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 just the, the possibility of the likelihood of ever being published for an over the transom piece there is." Astronomical. Doesn't happen. Yeah. So I, I sent it along, uh, and to my surprise, a few weeks later, a phone rings in the kitchen. It's David Remnick on the phone. Yeah. They ran the piece, and I mean, I had a book contract, a book deal within uh, within days. And um, when the book came out, it very quickly uh, transformed my life. I mean, changed everything. Now, the book and the article is this like grab your attention look at things you don't know about what goes on inside the restaurant and all kinds of things. But, I mean, it's the writing is powerful. H- had you been writing while you were cooking? No, I had writer's been sitting workshops, in, I had writing been, classes. Uh, I, I, do, I had done a, a, a writer's workshop with Gordon Lish, the uh, notorious uh, a creative writing a teacher at one point many years earlier. But I never actually written. And I think, to a great extent, the reason Kitchen Confidential sounds like it does is... I just did not have the luxury or the burden of a lot of time to sit around and contemplate the mysteries of the universe. I had to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, write for an hour and a half, and then I had to go to work, to a real job. Uh, so I, here I was. I, uh, it was liberating in the sense that I had no time to, to, to think about what I was writing. And I certainly had no customer or reader in mind because I was quite sure no one would ever read it. Uh, that was in many ways a... A very liberating uh, place to be, and I've kind of tried to stick with that business model since. We are now on your third television show. You did a show <laughs> called No Reservations for yep. the Food Channel, right? Yep. And then The Layover, 48 Hours. And actually, and before that, there was a, a cook store. So okay, right, right. Third network, fourth show. Right. And now you're traveling around the world, visiting places uh, in parts unknown. And I thought we'd begin with the clip. This is the beginning of your trip to Borneo on the series. Um, Let's just listen how it starts. When I first went up this river, I was sick with love. The bad kind. The fist around your heart kind. I ran far, but there was no escaping it. It followed me upriver all the way. That was ten long years ago. A previous episode of a previous series in a previous life. Yet here I am again, heading up to that same longhouse in the jungle. And that's from your series, Parts Unknown. You know, these are part travelogue, part personal essay, and a lot about food. This seemed really personal. What did you want to? Why did you want to go back to this little village in Borneo for ten, after ten um, years? I kind of. Uh, I think I wanted to see how things had changed. Uh, someone said, some travel writer said that you know you what you're really looking at when you travel is inward <laughs> all the time. The, the first time I went up that river, the Scrang River, uh, from Kuching up to a uh, uh, Iban longhouse in the jungle, I, I was heartbreaking. I was coming off of a of a love affair that did not pan out the way I had hoped. I think in a lot of ways, the motivation for the show, the second one, was uh, to see if it still hurt, you know, uh, to uh, see how I felt. Um, So it was very personal. I thought I'm going to go right back to the same long house. Yes, let's see how that community has changed. But really it was revisiting an old wound to see if... uh, it was okay now. There's a moment in this, a powerful scene in there. I mean, in this episode where you're standing in a pouring rain with a spear in your hand. Mm-hmm. You've been granted an honor by the village. Yeah. Explain this. Well, uh, I think both times. Uh, mm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to move the, uh, the camera up a little bit. I don't know if that's going to help with anything. I'm going to do it anyway. Okay, I'm working off, an, off of an iPad, so the angles are just bizarre. But what I want to do is carry out the orange and yellows up into here and make the couch a little bit thicker, um, the painting in there. 
So that's what I'm working on while we listen to Anthony Bourdain on Fresh Air, my favorite. Uh, when I went to the, both times that I went to the village as the guest of honor, you know, they kill a pig uh, for the feast. The whole village eats. Uh, there's an equitable division of pig parts. Uh, it's a big deal. Uh, but that first time, I never, I don't think I'd ever killed an animal before. I mean, I'd been ordering them up as a chef over the phone, so I was culpable in the death of many animals. But here I was being asked to physically plunge a spear into the heart of a pig. It seemed to be the height of hypocrisy, however uncomfortable I might have been with that, to put it off on somebody else. You know, I've been responsible for the death of many animals. Here I'm being asked... I didn't want to let the team down. I didn't want to, to dishonor the, uh, the, 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 the village uh, or embarrass anyone. I, the first time uh, was very, 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 very difficult. My camera guys almost passed out. It was certainly very difficult for me. The second time, as much as I'd like to say that it was still really hard, uh, and I think I said in the, in the voiceover, uh, I don't know what it says about me, probably something very bad. Uh, that I've become, you know, I have changed over time. I like to think in good ways for the most part, but I've also become more callous. I, I've become able to plunge a spear into the heart of a screaming pig uh, and live with that much more comfortably than I did the first time. And uh, I could lie and say uh, it tormented me forever uh, and, and, and since, but, but, you know, I felt that ugly emotion or lack of it, and I thought I should mention it. Yeah, you said you said I did it this time without hesitation or remorse. Yeah. But it was a relief when the screaming stopped. Well, yes, no one, no good person likes to hear or see an animal in pain. That is monstrous. I mean, I tried very hard to do a good job quickly. Um, yeah, exactly right. Uh, you had a memorable episode recently where you went to Vietnam. And you write, I can't remember whether you said this on an episode or whether I read it somewhere else. You said the world tilted for you in a Vietnamese rice farmer's home. Yeah, I, I think uh, the first time I went to Vietnam, I, I just I remember coming away from it thinking, I just, I have to have more of this. This is, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Is, more of is, Vietnam or more of that I want to be able to come back to Vietnam again and again and again. And, and if, if this place is so wonderful, the world must be filled with many more wonderful and interesting and challenging uh, and heartbreaking and inspiring and beautiful places, as it turned out to. But I really got that, that the first time I went there, I think I found myself sitting in a, you know, it was a rice farmer's home in the, in the Mekong Delta. Uh, at the time, they were a little more suspicious of Westerners with cameras. So um, the people who I was allowed to eat dinner with were all uh, former Viet Cong with impeccable revolutionary credentials, the sort of people who you would think would be hostile to Americans, particularly in that area where they caught a lot of ugly action. I could just hammer drunk and had this sort of mm -hmm. wonderful bonding experience. I remember this like, 85-year-old uh, former Viet Cong, I, I, I asked him, aren't you angry about anything? And he looked in with... Uh, Amiable contempt said, "Look, buddy, basically go to Vietnam. Don't take yourself so seriously. Before you, there were, you know, the French, the Japanese, you know, the Chinese, the Cambodians. Since you, there's been, you know, I, I've been fighting. This country's been fighting for six hundred years. Don't take it personally. Now drink. You go to some far-flung, exotic places, and some places that are a lot closer to home. And I wanted to play a clip. This is from your visit to a place in Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> yes." Uh, donkeys that uh, makes cheesesteaks mm -hmm. right across the river from Philadelphia, yes. known for cheesesteaks. You're sitting down to enjoy one with the owner. Let's listen. Pleasure to meet you. So this is the place, the best uh, cheesesteak in South Jersey, unless I'm mistaken? Uh, in New Jersey. In New Jersey, period. Yeah. Is there a difference between Jersey style and Philadelphia style? Yeah, we do ours on a round. Obviously, Kaiser will. Really? I'll have one of those. What's the way to go? I mean, anything I need to know or just... No, a regular cheese and onions. A beautiful thing. I need one, Paul. It's round. It's got steak, spices, <laughs> browned onions, real American cheese, such as it is, and a poppy seed roll. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. And it is sublime. Relish? What do you think? That's hot pepper. Yeah, a little bit of that. A little bit. Oh, man, I drove a long way for this. Thinking about it the whole way. Good. 
national landmark right away. This sandwich is unbelievably good. Thanks. Really a thing of beauty. That's good to hear. Worth driving across the state in a blizzard for. Well, we get a lot of people from Philly. No way. Philly? Yes, for sure. Wow, that's treason. Do they, like, change the plates on their car and, like, wear a disguise? I mean, it's different. The poppy seeds help. Yeah, I no, like to roll It's awesome. That's delicious. Well, I think we've learned something here today. Jersey cheese sticks. I'm not saying they're better than Philadelphia. Yeah, I am, actually. So there. This is great. Glad you enjoyed it. That's fun. That, that joint's about five miles from here. I'm going yeah, to get over stuff. there. I'm going to get over there. Do, do you care about the reactions you get from the locals after that? I care about the local. Uh, yes, I what I want to happen, ideally, and it, it's a weird, it's a double-edged sword. Um, ideally, I'll go to a place like, uh, I'll find a little bar in Rio, let's say, uh, some little local place that perfectly expresses the neighborhood. You know, it's not on the, it's not a tourist-friendly place. The response I'm looking for is to hear from someone from the neighborhood saying, uh, how did you ever find that place? I thought only we knew about it. It's, you know, a, a truly a place that we love and is reflective of our culture and our neighborhood. But on the other hand, it's kind of a destructive process because if I name the place, and I don't always when it's a place like that, I've changed it. The next time I go back, there's tourists. There's people who've seen it on the show. And then I might hear from the same person from that neighborhood saying, you ruined my favorite bar. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all the regular customers have run away and it's filled with, you know, the tourists and uh, me t-shirts and flip-flops. Do you sometimes protect somebody's There are times that I have looked at the camera and said, look, I, I, I'm just not going to tell you where this place is. I don't want to change it. It should stay like this forever. I do do that now and again. You're known for being willing to eat just about anything. What's some of the most intimidating or nasty stuff you've been on? I don't know. I mean, at this point, if freshness and hygiene is a question, I mean, and generally it's tribal situations. Oh, somebody's calling me. All right, I gotta, I gotta go. Somebody's calling me. It's important. Oh no, I'll leave it on. Hold on. I just got another job. <laughs> so that's what that's about. So happy painting in a minute. I just gotta call my friend. I'm gonna leave I'm just gonna leave the camera rolling because with studio mates they're in and out anyway, so it doesn't really matter.
can't, apparently I can't just hang out and be your studio mate. Uh, we're going to end this session. I know it's really scattered, but I got another job and now I have to go do my laundry so I have something clean to wear tomorrow morning. Um, and I guess we'll finish up the uh, interview with Anthony Bourdain later and uh, great, um, as well as Lauren Mitchell. Sorry to be so scattered and weird, but this is my life. <laughs> It's shitty, and then it's not, and then it's shitty again, and then it's not, and that's just like for everybody in general. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys later. Ciao. Ciao.